Thank you so much, David. Uh, well, I'm delighted to be here. And I was very honored to be asked to, to speak at this conference. It's a community that I love and have done so for, for many years. And my instructions were to talk about whatever I wanted. So I'm gonna do that. I'm going to talk essentially about 3D print at an industrial scale and some of the challenges we face. And many of those challenges would benefit from the skill sets in this room. So I'll try to point that out as we go along. And I hope that every one of you will find at least something interesting or new in this talk. Uh, and my slides are not progressing. <laughs> Pardon? So the arrow keys won't do it? Sorry for our technical uh, delay setting up. I was going to play some audio. We're unable to do that, unfortunately. Um, there we go. So I, what do I press? Just uh, the, down. Down. Yeah, I was. And it, well, okay. Okay. <laughs> well, I am unable to operate my computer, apparently. So a lot of you will have heard of the fourth industrial revolution, a term coined, I believe, by Klaus Schwab at the, um, the uh, World Economic Forum back uh, in a book he wrote in 2016. And what it means essentially is the idea that our physical and our digital and our biological worlds are converging in such a way to create a whole new world of manufacturing. And this has happened before in, I will admit, a fairly Eurocentric view of history. Uh, this has happened before with three previous industrial revolutions. The first being the advent of the steam engine and railroads in the mid 1700s to 1800s. The second being the invention of electricity from the late 1800s into the early 1900s. And then the digital revolution, essentially from the 60s to the 90s with the advent of semiconductors and the internet and computing. But the idea is that now, what with all the technological improvements in certain areas, we may be seeing a vastly new world of manufacturing and industry uh, in the fourth industrial revolution. And this is building off of skill sets, I think well known to all of you, such as internet working, sensors and actuators. They often forget to mention the actuators in talking about this industrial revolution. Artificial intelligence, machine learning, big data, robotics, and also, improvements uh, in the technologies in biology, like genetic sequencing and gene editing and software controlling a lot of this. But additive manufacturing has a special place as part of industry 4.0, which is essentially another term for the fourth industrial revolution, although I think it predates um, the, the other terms. I think it came out of Germany in Hanover in like 2011, but I don't know specifically who coined the term. But there are uh, a lot of reasons why additive manufacturing is peculiarly appropriate for Industry 4.0, and that has to do with some of the ideals behind Industry 4.0, which include one of my favorites is the democratization of manufacturing. That's the idea that individuals or small communities can make what they need instead of having to rely on getting things from other places. We'll talk more about that as things go along. And then there's also the opportunity to deal with supply chain problems. And this is something that we saw quite a bit in additive manufacturing uh, in the early part of the COVID pandemic. And I'll talk a little bit about that, but HP and its partners and uh, all of our customers all around the world uh, pitched in during the COVID pandemic to print the supplies that local clinics and hospitals were unable to get. So there's a picture here of HP's nasal swab. <laughs> Gazillions of these were printed. I myself was a lucky recipient of an HP nasal <laughs> swab. Um, I don't think it was any more comfortable than any of the other kinds out there. Uh, but uh, this, this really did help in a lot of local cases to deal with the shortages. So there's been a huge hype cycle around 3D print um, over and over again, but this time I think the data shows that it really was able to help step in where supply chains faltered. Also, um, I, I know that all of the branches, at least of the US Armed Forces, have 3D printers in their forward operating bases because it can be very difficult to get shipments in and out. So emergency preparedness and sustainability, these are all part of the ideals of Industry 4.0 and things that, that 3D print can help with. How many of you own a, um, a 3D printer or have easy access to one? 
So you're familiar with the idea of, oh, I should be in front of the mic, sorry. You're familiar with the idea then of laying down layer by layer, building up a part. So that's cool. Yeah, so Industry 4.0 is not just about individual printers like that. It's also about whole factory floors of printers, like you see in this photo here from one HP customer site. On the left, there are rows and rows of printers. On the right, rows and rows of cleaning stations. There's more behind me. Um, and many of our larger sites, this is all automated. So they're like little railroad tracks on the floor and things can be moved between stations automatically. Uh, but I'm not allowed to have photos of those sites, unfortunately. So uh, I've mentioned uh, the, the supply chain issues in, uh, with COVID and additive manufacturing, the relationship there. So here's a chart of data drawn from printers all around the world because our customers allow us to pull this data from their printers. And what we have on the bottom is time from left to right, starting at late November, 2019, up through mid-May of 2020. So the early part of the pandemic. And on the right, the vertical axis is essentially liters of molten plastic or, or the, the uh, volume of parts being printed. And, uh, and that's represented by the blue line. And then the yellow line is the um, axis on the right, which is number of parts printed. And as you look at the lines, you see a big dip in, the, in late December, early January. That's something we see every year uh, because there are winter holidays in lots of places around the world. But you see another dip around March and into April. That shouldn't be there. That's the COVID pandemic striking and a lot of manufacturing shut down. So as manufacturing picked back up, you'll see an interesting kind of an inversion with the, um, the, in the graph where now there are more parts being printed than uh, volumes. I, I mean, I know it's a, a apples to oranges comparison, but we see that inversion across all the countries, just about all of the countries. And what that means is people are starting to print a lot more smaller parts. Those are the COVID parts like nasal swabs and connectors to help keep face shields on and all those things that hospitals and clinics ran out of and now are being produced all around the world. This is a summary of the world, but you can look at individual countries as well. Uh, the Czech Republic on one side, you can see how um, man manufacturing 3D printing picked up, uh, but then it fell back off to normal levels. The supply chain issues got worked out. And then in Canada is an example of where um, I, I really should carry this further into the into uh, more recent past. So you can see it, but the level stayed constant after it picked up. And that's because Canada was investing in additive manufacturing and this just got them jump started a little sooner perhaps than they had intended. So that's the context of 3D print and additive manufacturing. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about the materials that we use. There are lots and lots of different materials in the industry. Metal has become a huge deal in the industry, being able to print metal parts for automotive and, and other, um, other industries. Uh, and there are things like printing concrete for construction, build a house in a day kinds of things, printing biological tissues with the goal of being able to manufacture things like organs at some point. Uh, that's not really at industrial scale yet. But I'm going to point out a couple more because uh, I particularly like them. One of them is paper. There are uh, printers that print with paper, uh, not just 2D printers, but 3D printers. This banana is an example. It was printed on an MCOR iris printer. Uh, MCOR's assets now belong to Clean Green 3D and they have a new paper printer. But what happens is you put down a piece of laminated paper and you automatically cut it into the shape of the periphery of that part at that layer and you ink it along the edges with what color it should be at that layer and then you repeat the process building up the part out of paper and that banana was done that way and I don't know if you can see it uh, but if you get close to it you can see some layering on the side because the banana was actually printed on its side. Another I think really interesting material is dirt. So in the middle, we have an example of a project out of Italy where they are printing support structures with local dirt. So, you know, dig it up here, put it in your printer there. And this addresses a supply chain problem that I glossed over when I mentioned um, how additive could help with supply chain problems, because the materials you use to print are also something that you have to get from somewhere. So there are people who are actually working on that as well. What can we do with locally available materials? So that's um, of several different kinds of materials, but the bulk of what's used in industry still is plastics. And there are lots of different kinds of plastics and processes 
Uh, the FDM printers a lot of you are familiar with use deposition modeling where you melt a filament that's extruded and build the layers up using that. That's not much used in industry, but there is some industrial use of it. Uh, there's SLA or stereolithographic methods where you have a vat of resin and you shine UV lights at particular points to harden the resins um, where you want the, the part to be hard and gradually pull it out of the resin layer by layer to pick it up. There's uh, SLS, selective laser sintering, where you also uh, point lasers at, in this case, uh, a bed of powder um, to fuse to melt the, uh, the, the plastic powder where you want the part to be solid. And then there's MJF, or multi-jet fusion, which is HP's process, um, also a powder-based process. And we'll talk more about that. That's the process that I'm most familiar with because that's the one I use. And, um, and it's uh, got a lot of good industrial uses. So uh, all of these different processes have their pros and cons, depending on what you would like to do. Uh, so I just for grins, I have uh, the same part printed on two processes, a Stratasys Polyjet, which is also a technology I really like, and the MGF, which is ours on the, on the right. And you can see that there are a lot of differences. So uh, it really depends on the process and material you're, you're using. I think the color and the textures may be the most obvious difference. Uh, the the uh, MJF parts feel a little bit more like stained wood than, uh, than a lot of the plastics. Uh, the colors might be a little bit more saturated. Uh, in part, that might be because I actually vapor polished the, the HP parts. Uh, the resolution might be finer, I think, um, in this case on the polyjet. Uh, and also it avoids a bug that you see on the right. If you look at the top part on the right, you'll see that two of the color swirls are the same color and they're not supposed to be. And on the Stratasys part, they're not. And that's because of how uh, we map the color space of the design space to the color gamut um, on the printer. The printers all have a smaller color gamut than uh, the design spaces. And that's something I had to write a plug in for so you could actually see during the design phase that you weren't getting what you intended. So that's something that Stratasys had dealt with better. So that's, that's a little bit about materials uh, in general. Uh, but now I was going to go into how MJF in particular works because that's relevant to some of what we'll talk about next. So imagine that we're looking straight sideways at an empty print bed. Uh, the, the print platform is actually, as we build up the parts, it's going to sink lower and lower into a, what's a big bucket. Uh, but right now it's empty. And the first thing that happens is it gets a layer of powder spread across it. And you can think of this layer of powder almost like it's a sheet of paper because our technology does come from things like our ink check uh, printers that print on in 2D, 2D on paper. So then what happens is a, an array of print heads, much like an inkjet printer sweeps across this layer of powder and drops agents or inks uh, wherever you want to have the powder turned into a solid part. So this is a fusing agent. And then there are heat lamps which heat up the powder and only where the fusing agent is does it melt the plastic and that will eventually cool to a solid part. And then the process is repeated and you build it up layer by layer. Now, one of the things I wanted to point out is you note that there's an overhang. This layer that we just put down reaches out over the layer below it. And those of you with FDM printers know that you might have to put in supports then to keep layers with overhang from, um, from warping or drooping and things like that. You don't have to with powder-based printers. This is one of the cool things because the unfused powder below the overhang acts as its support naturally. So that makes possible printing very interesting uh, geometries like interlocking chains and things like that without any assembly required. And we'll talk about that more a little bit too. Here's a video just showing the process. So fusing and then another layer of powder more fusing, more powder, and you get the idea of this from another angle. So that's, that's how the process works. Are there any questions so far? Feel free to stop it with questions at any time. Okay, so after printing, there's still a lot of things that have to happen. And this would be automated in the larger industrial settings, uh, but this is uh, photos of it's being done manually. So now that you've finished printing, you have a big bucket of unfused powder and molten plastic, and that's got to cool. 
and there are ways of speeding up the cooling process. But in generally, the best thing to do is just to let it sit until it cools naturally. And that can take up to 36 hours, uh, depending on the volume of molten plastic you have in that thing. So that bucket gets pulled out of the printer. Uh, it's the upper left-hand corner, and then below it, it's sitting cooling. And then below that, it's getting pushed into a cleaning station. Uh, again, this would all be automatic in a, a, a different setting. Then the middle column, you vacuum up the unfused powder, leaving yourself a jumble of parts. And then at the very bottom, you can see there are parts there, but they are covered with a layer of semi-fused nylon powder, and you've got to get rid of that. So <clears throat> on the far column, that is a bead blasting machine where you, you blast little glass beads at the parts, you put the parts inside, you stick your arms in through the, uh, the holes there and try to use these horrible rubber lobster claws to hold the parts and blast them uh, to clean them. And then uh, finally, after you have your clean parts, you uh, have the opportunity to do different kinds of post-processing. That's an example of a part printed on a color printer that was vapor smooth. Lots of kinds of things you can do, like dyeing the parts. Uh, they're nylons. So you can use clothing dyes on them, spray paints, and so forth. So I'm not going to talk any more about post-processing unless people have questions in particular about it. So that is the MJF process. Why is it interesting for industry or individuals? Uh, there are several different features it has, that, uh, and some of the other uh, processes also have that make it interesting. So first, you can print strong and relatively flexible parts. That's because we process whole layers at once, so those layers are pretty quickly, so those layers are still hot when you do the next layer, so you get a better mechanical bonding between the layers. Uh, we don't just do point uh, fusing on layer by layer. And then you can also print relatively fine features. That's because we have very small voxel size. A voxel is like a 3D pixel. It's your smallest controllable unit of printing. Uh, and ours is about 20 by 20 microns in the horizontal X and Y directions and about 80 in the vertical direction. So layer by layer, about 80 microns. Uh, so that's reasonably small, so you can get a lot of control that way. There's also a wide range of geometries we can print. I think I mentioned that because it's powder based and you don't have to worry about supports. And we have voxel level control uh, for color, but not just color, also for things like uh, printing conductive traces through parts and, and other kinds of materials. And finally, this is amenable to automation and customization because of the speed and size of the print bed. So all the parts that I show here are things that I've designed myself, unless otherwise credited, um, and examples of fine, flexible things you can print. So for instance, um, here we go. I can maybe pass these around. Are you able to? Yeah, so, um, so this is one of the reasons I got into 3D print is uh, I was told you can't print feathers. And that was because there are these robots that go around um, in labs traveling around and uh, they would sneak up on me when I was in my cube because I couldn't see them over the cube walls and they would terrify me. And so I decided I wanted to put headdresses on all of them with plumes. And so why not 3D print them? And then, so I went to go ask our 3D print folks, how do you do that? And they said, you can't print feathers, that's absurd. So I wondered, really? And that's how I got into 3D print, because yes, you can print feathers. So, um, and then there's examples down below here of all sorts of crazy geometries you can print because this is powder-based. Let's see, I guess I can. I'll pass out a these in a minute also. Um, let's see. I'll actually wait on these, this will be. <laughs> Watch it be in the next slide, I don't know. Okay, so, so that's the kind of thing we can print. Those are the, the features of the printer that we want to exploit. Ironically, those same features are all the, the things that make it hard to do this. So we can print all these things on our printers. The problem is we can't design them. So we can't get the digital design to the printer because traditional 3D CAD software just can't handle a lot of this. So a lot of the challenges are in the software and design space, and there's some others as, as we move along as well uh, that I'll point out. So one of the problems is caused by our ability to print fine features. That's a lot of complexity. We're, we have parts now with millions of geometries on them, and try to get SolidWorks to handle millions of geometries on your part. You'll be very unhappy. There's also an issue of what I call design for intent versus design for the print process. We can print these parts with interlocking, no assemblies, and things like that, uh, but you end up having to design what you want to work in the print bed, which is different from what you want it to be after you pull it out of the print bed. So imagine uh, you have 
uh, a chain you're printing. And when you pull it out of the print bed, the chain surfaces will touch. But you can't let them touch in your design while it's being printed or they'll fuse together. So you have to print them carefully going through each other's middle so that you have unfused powder between them to keep them separated. And if there has to be some distance there. So there are all sorts of design constraints on what you actually have to do in the print bed to make this work. So uh, that, that's an issue we'll see, I guess, also a little bit more in a minute. Uh, and then there's uh, all sorts of issues about that voxel control. We can control materials agents voxel by voxel, but what it, where's the software to do that? There's a very limited software there. Also dimensional control. Uh, this is less software and more on the printing side. Uh, this is an area where it is absolutely ripe for machine learning and other, um, other techniques to help improve. You have this print bed full of hot plastic layer by layer, depending on where you are in the print bed and what your part um, is it being printed next to another part? The thermals, the temperatures throughout that print volume uh, vary considerably and have an effect on warpage and things like that. And you really want to sense what's going on at one layer so you can correct for it at the next layer. And that's a challenging problem and one that I know many in this room have skills that um, could help be applied to that. There's also design for customization. We'll talk about that a little more. The examples here are automated customizations, uh, a workflow for that, where you give it a closed curve and tell it what kind of decoration you want, and it automatically goes and figures that out for whatever, for whatever geometry you gave it. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, some of the, the challenges that come up with uh, those different features. And those aren't the parts I want to play. I want... So here they are. Okay. So these parts, which are all here. Alrighty. Um, so these parts that I have here are from a uh, new business vertical that HP started up um, in the area of sustainable packaging. And the packaging is not plastic, <laughs> that would not be sustainable. We're actually printing the industrial tooling for a certain kind of packaging that um, I would like to see a lot more of in the world because this packaging is very sustainable. So this egg carton is an example of molded fiber packaging, or some people call it uh, pulp, pulp fiber packaging. And egg trays and uh, disposable hospital supplies, all sorts of things are being, are being um, made in uh, fiber molded. Uh, processes now. The, the issue is, and it's, it's in very, very uh, sustainable packaging because it uses uh, cellulose, things like old corrugated cardboard or things you were going to burn in the field anyway, like sugarcane husks. All you need is some kind of cellulose and you grind it up and put it in water and make a slurry out of it. And so it's using 100% recyclable materials um, as input, and then the part at the end can be composted or, um, or recycled, depending on what you've done um, with it in, in the meantime. So very sustainable packaging we'd like to see more of. The problem is that it's expensive and very time consuming to get the industrial tooling for it. So what is done traditionally is you get a very fine wire mesh and you put it over a metal form that has the shape of the, the fiber pulp parts like your egg carton that you want. And you beat that wire mesh down to take the shape of that form and you cut it and you sew it by hand. And uh, it takes a lot of expertise and it's done by hand and very expensive. <clears throat> so the industry has for 20 years now wanted to 3D print these, uh, these screens. And we haven't been able to because you have to make something that's a millimeter or less thick for the screen and has gazillions of holes on it. And there just weren't uh, materials and processes that could do that. But now we can. This is an example of a screen for one of our customers here. It's an older example, so um, it might look a little smoother with the process now. Uh, it might be hard to see, but that's just covered with like millions of tiny holes. And there is no CAD software out there that's gonna handle those millions of tiny holes, especially because you need carefully to control the spacing between them. And, the, um, and you want to avoid any distortion of that spacing or distortion of the size or shape of those holes, even around areas of very tight curvature, or else you'll get uneven pulping results. 
So that was that's we we were all happy that we could print these things and then discovered we couldn't design them to print them. So that's the kind of thing I've been working on recently is figuring out how to design those things. And what we ended up doing was turning to a technology that isn't even in the 3D print world or CAD world. We ended up turning to the industry of like side effects and gaming uh, and animation to use uh, programs like Houdini by side effects, because with those kinds of programs, you can manipulate hundreds and thousands to millions of points very efficiently. But they aren't designed for creating 3D parts either. So we had to build out all those workflows using um, those platforms as a basis. And this has to be automated so that a customer can just give you whatever surface and you can generate a whole two set. So um, I'm missing one part here. Okay, so I was just gonna pass this around. This is the form here with the big holes. This is the screen that fits over it. You can, it has clips, so try not to clip it. It's really hard to, <laughs> to get it unclipped. And this is the transfer that comes and pulls the wet part off the screen where when you pull all that up out of the slurry. So the form and the uh, screen get dipped down into that slurry. There's a huge vacuum that sucks the, um, the slurry through the screen and the form tool so that all the fibers lay down against the screen. You pull that up out of the slurry, pop off the wet part using the transfer tool. And there you have, and you let that dry. And there you have your egg carton. Um, so it has to be very robust to go through all those cycles of pressure and dipping. Okay, so that's fine, uh, flexible and strong parts. Uh, but I also mentioned that we can print some interesting geometries because it's a powder-based process. So I was going to um, talk around some of those. Um, can I throw? Will people catch? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's pretty strong stuff. I don't know. <laughs> I haven't gotten to throw plastic parts at people for two years now, so you just have to indulge me. Uh, but you all are way back there, so, uh, <laughs> okay, David, <laughs> I got to throw some things at least. Okay. Just like pass these out. Yeah, and I'll put some more things in your hands just a sec here. <laughs> yeah, okay, great. <laughs> Yeah, well, we'll start with those. Uh, oh, yeah, I can pass these. Okay. Okay, here's one more. <laughs> okay. There we go. So these are examples of uh, no assembly parts. You, know, you can 3D print things that would take quite a while to assemble. And anybody in manufacturing knows that every time you can skip an assembly step, you want to skip it because they are expensive and error prone. So uh, one of the examples here on the far left is a fabric that's made of two directions of hinges. So that it will bend one way or orthogonally, but not in other directions. Um, and the others are uh, inter, you know, interlocking chain mails and things. There's um, an example there of a part floating inside another part. That's the coronavirus containment system from early in the pandemic when people still thought it could be contained. I was a little skeptical, so it's a kind of a catharsis I made that part. Um, but I'm actually going to look at the bobbin because this is an example of what I mean, a small example, what I mean by the democratization of 3D print or manufacturing. The idea here is that you have a need. I, I did, I couldn't find a commercial uh, solution that really worked for me anywhere. And um, there's a printer so I can print a solution. The part that's not well democratized yet is you still need the training to be able to design the parts. So that's a huge place where I'd love to see us work on making design processes something that anybody can do without special training. So the problem here, anybody who knits or crochets, raise your hand. No? <laughs> oh, surely. Oh, yay. Somebody in the back. Yes. Yes. So anybody who does color work knows that you end up with the picture of that mess in the upper left-hand corner if you're using a lot of colors. What you really want is to have each color strand uh, snugged up on a little bobbin right next to your material. And then with one hand, that's important to be able to pull loose just the amount you need to use when you get to it. So here's a bobbin that makes that possible. And we can do it only because we can print one part inside the other part. So there's the bobbin design on the left and then the two parts that are its components on the right. And, uh, and it works because 
we can print that spiral uh, on the right and there are little pads where you can squeeze the spiral down, pushes those little crosses inside the spinning bobbin part and releases it. Uh, and because the material is stiff enough, it pops back um, and stops the, uh, the thing from being able to spinning just when you want it to. So uh, those are some of the parts passed around. The, the, um, all the parts I'm showing here, uh, while some of them may seem fanciful, there's actually always a, an experimental reason behind them, or I wouldn't get to uh, play with them and, and print them. And these are experiments in trying to figure out the final gauge of the part. This is an example of that design for intent versus design for the print bed. Uh, because you have a size of part and a behavior that you want in your design, how do you work backwards from that to how you have to print it to get to that? Um, what what uh, shape and form and layout should it be inside your print bed? Because again, surfaces can't touch or they'll fuse. So it can be hard to predict what the gauge of the final part will be. If all the angles are just orthogonal, it's not an issue. But if you have any interesting angles, like some of the parts that I passed around, it can be really hard to figure out the gauge. As far as I know, this, is, this problem is not generally solved. So if anybody's interested, there's stuff that can be done there. Here's a, another example of the um, issue of trying to print things in a print bed. You have to design for the print bed. Um, what you want a long chain, you're gonna have to figure out how to coil it up. In this case, it's carefully um, situated so that no link is at a different angle than any other link because there is a difference in strength between things in the X, Y direction and interlayer direction. And uh, our process is very strong, relatively speaking, in across layers, but it is weaker than in the X, Y direction. And we didn't want any chain links to be um, weaker than others because this was being used for hanging some very heavy things, including people. Um, so all sorts of issues of how you fold things up and get them to work inside the print bed. And this lock here is an example of total failure. So uh, there are some parts that are not amenable to reducing assembly, although I tried valiantly figuring out which combinations of, I shouldn't use the word combination, it is a combination lock, which of the different uh, components could be printed together with no assembly to reduce the amount of assembly. And no matter which set I picked, if I tried to put enough of them together, because surfaces can't touch as you print them or a little fuse, but you ended up with just enough space between things, I could always figure out a way to jimmy the lock open. So it's a working combination lock, but it's also one that's easy to bust open. So not every design is amenable to that. And again, that's a problem that has not been solved in the general case. It would be wonderful to take a design and automatically have software that looks at it and says, well, these components could be printed together to avoid assembly and just, you know, just go with that and have it work. But that is, again, not something that's been solved at all. So one of the other features is voxel control, per voxel control. And the most obvious type of agent we want to control is color. Uh, so uh, you'd think, because color is such a fundamental part of design, that this would be a solved problem, and it is totally not. What you see here, going from uh, left to right and up, is the direction of increasingly computational approaches to uh, adding color to a design. So this egg, <laughs> I guess you could pass this around. <laughs> yeah, uh, this one is a little, little uh, delicate here. Um, so that one is a little delicate. I won't throw it. Um, that is um, actually an experiment in making tiny hinges and latches, but I wanted to color it. It was printed on a regular printer. I thought, wouldn't it be fun to print that in color? And it is a nightmare to color that part because you have to use one of these um, paint by hand, essentially, um, applications. And you've painted one flower, it should learn and be able to print uh, to paint all of the other flowers. It should be able to learn to understand what are the borders that humans would would believe might be separable, um, separately paintable uh, components. And there's no such thing. You just have to do it um, by hand, essentially. The feather there, um, do I have, I might not have brought the feather. The feather is just a computational gradient applied across the length of the part, that's easy. The cat food dish holder there looks like it's finger painted. It is actually an application uh, written to um, examine uh, lattices to see when lattice holes are small enough they might fuse together and to flag them with color. And instead I gave it absurdly large parameters and got that effect. The dragon fruit there, that's a technique from animation where you um, can find the, um, the medial axes of, of, of limbs for animating, getting animatable skeletons to use for animating various figures. Instead, we used it to determine a color gradient uh, for the part and reflected the distance from the tips of those skeletal appendages out to the part surface. And finally, the fish, 
is an example of building the color in right from the beginning of the design. Fundamentally, each lattice cell is actually interconnecting links um, and they're all different colors. So you kind of get an effect that the colors are different from different angles. <laughs> So that's color, and it is a wild mess, missing workflows uh, and uh, just a nightmare right now. Uh, but even worse are trying to deal with some other kinds of per voxel control agents. So being able to print those uh, metallic uh, conductive materials throughout your part. So imagine you have a part um, and you can print circuitry through embedded in the center of your part. That is a very hard design problem right now because you really want to be able to control your design voxel by voxel and say, what are the agents or behaviors for particular voxels? And as you can imagine, there are a lot of voxels in a print volume. So too much data and no way of, uh, of, of, of being able to specify different areas of the volume easily. These are examples of using an agent that controls opacity. So you can see uh, with the, the light behind these parts that some parts are more uh, opaque than other parts. And that's because of the opacity, the agent controlled um, voxel per voxel. The lamp panel in the middle, if you hold it up in regular light, it just looks like flowers. But if you put a backlight on it, you can see that there are hidden layers in there that, with more opacity. And one of, the, um, one of the other things that needs to be automated uh, where you really want some software to look at a shape and have learned what it should do about the shape of this design to make the design cleanable. Because you can bead blast off that, uh, that layer on the outside of the parts, the semi-fused powder, but how do you get the powder out from inside parts? Uh, that can be very hard. Like that coiled tube on the left, I actually have to print that with its own accessory, a chain on the inside, so I can use that chain to wiggle out and loosen the powder. Finally, you pull out the ch whole chain and all the powder comes out. Uh, but I have to do that as part of my design. I would like that to be automatic. Um, and cages, so you can bead blast feathers so they don't flap around or other, of course, other uh, maybe less fanciful parts. That caging, there are programs to do that caging. They're not very good. So this is an area that is ripe for automation and just examining a part and having learned enough about parts to know how to create automatically the cleaning accessories that are needed for them. And that fish is an example of problems with lattices. Lattices are a, a really important part of industrial manufacturing right now because depending on the shape of the, uh, the lattice cells and the beam sizes, uh, you get very different mechanical behaviors. So that's, it's super important. But if a lattice is very thick or very fine, you can't get the powder out of the middle of it. There's, it's hard to clean unless it's flexible. So that fish is an example of a flexible lattice where uh, you wiggle it and the powder will come out. Customization and automation is a huge part of Industry 4.0. The idea is that it should be easy to print parts that are customized per person. So mass customization is another term. People might have heard of this. I also promised you mathematical jewelry. Here's a photo of uh, some of the, the jewelry. The idea is you give it whatever closed curve and it will sweep it around in a circle of the size that you have chosen and turn it the number of times that you've chosen to turn it, going around in that circle so you can get a movie, a strip and other kinds of behaviors. Um, and all of that's very easily customizable, logos and coasters. The point of this though, is that there are a lot of constraints that have to be satisfied. So if you just stand up a website and say, you know, print your bracelet or print your this, that, or the other thing, there's a lot of constraint checking you need to do, like make sure that some surfaces aren't close to other surfaces, that colors are going to be differentiable between each other if they're next to each other. Lots of constraint checking uh, that needs to be done automatically. This is where I wanted to be able to, to play some sound and unfortunately uh, we weren't able to get that set up. But this is an example of customization because I believe that customization, we've only touched the very tip of the iceberg here. Uh, and there are much richer kinds of customization that we could do in the industry uh, if we were to work on it a little harder. Sound is one of those areas. So uh, I had the, uh, the good fortune to be able to work with some of the folks at Karma, which is Stanford University's group uh, that does uh, computer music and digital acoustics and things. And one of the things that people in that area do is they take a shape and try to model what sound it ought to have. 
uh, and then compare the two what sound it really does have. And that's very hard, but there's another direction that's even harder for people who are interested, which is I want this, this certain sound. What kind of part do I need to design to get that sound? I think that nobody has touched that. And um, I think there could be a lot of benefits there. So these are all musical instruments printed with no assembly, except that uh, the whistle uh, there is stuck into the bellows. One of the downsides of our materials and processes right now is they're not cleared for ingestion. So while I can blow in the whistle, I can't really ask anybody else to put it in their mouth. So we made a bellows to play the wind instruments. And um, I think this might be the only instrument that I brought. <laughs> Somebody has a tendon. <laughs> So, okay, so that's printed with no assembly there. Uh, and there's just a ton more work that can be done in uh, sound and customization here. Finally, I know I mentioned the ants in the kitchen. And this is again, an example of what we mean by uh, customization and uh, being able to democratize the process of design and manufacturing. So where I live, the city has given everybody a little countertop compost bin and you put your food scraps in it and then when the bin is full you go and dump it in the big bin that the city picks up once a week and takes to their commercial composting site. The problem is you also get ants. Everybody where I live has ants and they're all over these compost uh, little countertop things all the time. So I, I guess you could use poisons but I'm not going to. I just I don't like that idea. I don't think they really work for ants in the long term anyway. So everything I have is in moats. And there isn't, you can't, there's no water in the moat when I took the uh, picture here, but uh, you just put water there and the ants don't cross the moat. So that has worked for the cat food dish for just about everything in my house. We no longer have ants, uh, but this is just, you know, trace the bottom of the bin, make a part, there you go, problem solved with no poisons. So that's the kind of thing that individuals could do. And now all my neighbors have these too. So it's just a little local community thing that's helped solve a problem for a lot of us. Or my son, when he was learning to drive, this post on the far left is right by the edge of our driveway. He was terrified he was going to back into it because you can't see it through the windows of the car. Problem solved with outdoor sculptures. So there's a lot of things you can do to help democratize manufacturing. Unfortunately, there's a lot of work to make that possible because while you might be able to print the thing, getting the design there is really hard, in part because not everybody has the training to do it and we need to make all of the, um, the design software much more amenable to, um, to creating these things and customizing these things. But, um, but also because uh, we're, we're just missing so many parts of the workflows uh, that people, we, if people can fill in these gaps, I think we could uh, really, really change the world of manufacturing. I mentioned a challenge. Now, I, I tried to point out some of the areas throughout this talk where people with skill sets in machine learning, uh, sensing, and uh, other things like that, where you could really make headway. Uh, the, the sensing problem inside a print bed is a very hard one because that thing gets super, super hot. You know, it's over 200 degrees centigrade. So what kinds of sensors can you possibly put in there to understand what's going on? Do you use IR, um, you know, from a distance? All, all sorts of different kinds of uh, temperature cameras and things, but you really want to get more fine grain control over temperatures in the print bed. So there, there are challenges like that on the print side, but here's another challenge. So I know a lot of people in this community work on drones and communication between swarms of drones. Uh, and then we have, the stationary printers. That's my rather poor rendering of an FDM printer. So these printers are just sitting there, but often where you need the print to be done is elsewhere. And uh, so people have put printers on uh, dollies and like little railroad tracks and things like that, or cars and driven them places. But wouldn't it be nice if you could actually get printers into other places, maybe very hostile places or uh, places that are inaccessible uh, by a truck, like maybe in a cave, things like that. This is actually a real problem where you want to start building up some kind of platform uh, in a place which you can't just get your printer to it. So the challenge here is, can we make our printers fly? 
So this is uh, a picture of a drone printing. Um, and there are a whole lot of challenges here, being able to sense the surface on which you are trying to print, being able to position the device exactly enough to get a reasonable resolution and um, not too much warpage of the part you're actually trying to print. Uh, what happens uh, about material? Uh, the, so that drone, as it loses material, it changes its weight. You also, so you have lots of different kinds of sensing and feedback loops to worry about. Uh, and then, so maybe we need to be able to feed it more material, bring in, uh, so there are feeder drones, or maybe there's a way of making use of local materials so that you don't have to bring in the materials for construction and printing. So you can imagine these might be quite large flying structures, uh, but this is actually a real problem. And if anybody is interested in thinking about this problem, I'd, I'd love to hear your ideas and uh, that would be a lively discussion. So that's the challenge flying printers. So to summarize, we've talked about additive manufacturing, Industry 4.0. Uh, we've talked about a lot of the things that industrial printers can now print that I think a lot of folks who uh, mostly have experience with uh, FDM printers at home don't have much experience with the kind of the larger possibility of geometries we can print uh, and the materials we can use. The problem is while we can print it, we can't actually design it. So we can't get something to the printer <clears throat> that we can print and lots of opportunities there to work on. So uh, <clears throat> I would love to talk to people about any ideas you have about that. And with that, I will conclude. Thank you. <laughs>